When you start acting like something that you're not, or you're trying to be something different from what your core is, people can feel it and sense it, and it comes out in your pores. Some of these grocery stores are like, we're super into innovation, like, yay, we love young emerging brands, and like, we want to do all these DEI things, and then you're like, but you don't. So just don't. Be who you are. This is Taste. I'm your host, Matt Rodbard. Alison Kane is the founder of Haven's Kitchen, a pioneering culinary school, cafe, and consumer brand that has been at the center of the New York City food world for nearly a decade. I absolutely loved catching up with Alison about her journey to launching the company and some of the wild events she has thrown over the years. We also talk about her pivot to the world of CPG and how she makes it all work in this very competitive world. It's a great talk, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. Allie Kane, welcome to This Is Taste. How are you? I'm great. I'm psyched to be here. It's so cool to meet you. I've uh, been to Haven's Kitchen uh, when you ran it. Um, the physical space, the cooking school. We'll go over the history of that. I think many of our listeners who have lived in New York have been to an event at Haven's Kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's one of those things where I didn't know how special it was until it was over a little bit. You know, I was just kind of building it and making it. We rode a really cool wave, I think, you know, 2012 to 2018 in New York City was just food and the beginning of experiential CPG things and yeah. so much innovation, so much creativity and so much money. It was definitely money was flowing yeah. into events. It was a great time for events. I remember going to a couple of in book events. Mm-hmm. I went to a great, you did a fundraiser. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was uh, like a Trump related fundraiser. Definitely. Yeah. yeah I it did was, a lot of those. It was a MAGA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. And um, yeah, no. It was it was uh, anti-Trump. That is what I meant to say. It is uh, <laughs> it was a a, a fundraiser for um, activism and and farm labor and, practices. Yeah, 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 yeah. We did a lot of you know the goal really was to be a nonprofit in a way that didn't have to fundraise. Yeah, you know that was my thought going in. It turned out to not be my end goal, no. but that's. I really wanted to use it to support, you know, better food system policy and all sorts of stuff and awareness. And I had no idea that this cooking school was going to be an event space for, you know, Google. I mean, who knew? Um, But it was it just it was a great ride. Well, the location was was ideal. Because it was like downtown, but not too quite downtown. Mm-hmm. But also, remind me what corners? It was 17th between 6th right. and 7th. Right. So Flatiron definitively. And yeah. and just a really great space, like multi-level. And I remember going to a piglet yep. there, yep. which was amazing. And you just I think you just had a great taste or you allowed people in there with great taste. Yeah. I think we had, you know, it's the same thing with teaching people how to cook. I think when you make it, when there are too many choices, people get analysis paralysis and they kind of freak themselves out when you're like, OK, here are the bones and and this is you can't mess this up. But if you want to have fried chicken, great. If you want to have sushi, mazel tov. Like we don't have we're not like chef doesn't chef doesn't do it that way. <laughs> you know, it was it was easy. Yeah, I think. And so you closed uh, Haven's Kitchen, the physical space mm-hmm. around the pandemic. Mm-hmm. But you have since kind of. I would say reinvigorated the brand as a CPG brand, a consumer packaged good brand that focuses on sauces. So catch us up to what Haven's Kitchen is now. Yeah. I mean, now we are what we call ourselves as a creative home cooking company. You know, we have our second product line coming out um, in February. The goal is really to be sort of the meal kit without the meal kit. So, you know, I've taught cooking for 25 years And I know that, like we were just talking about with events, people don't want a prescriptive, constrictive, you have to make this and this is what it's going to look like, you know, dinner. They want to be able to choose, do I want salmon? Do I want chicken? Do I want tofu? And most of the time, it's just, I don't know how to get the right seasoning or flavors. So our sort of solution is wherever you need flavor or seasoning or possibly texture will be that. You choose your protein, your veggie, your grain, whatever. And so the idea will really be to build out a portfolio of products that will help home cooks feel great. And a lot of the products are 
sauce related. When you talk about flavor and seasoning, yeah. you're you're you know applying uh, terroir and region and specific heritage foods into a sauce that's in a tetra pack or a jar, and you're adding it to protein and vegetables. Yeah, I think you know we. The question people always ask me when we just were the brick and mortar, you know, we were cooking school and in 2018, we had our first purchase order from Whole Foods, 14 stores, you know, three sauces. Um, And then 2020 went national with Whole Foods and that's things have really did Ellie Truesdale pick you up. No, it was John. Okay. John. Um, But, you know, I think that people would always say, what kind of cooking school, you know, and and I'd be like, there's so much amazing food from all around the world and American home cooks are excited to try different global flavors. I'm never going to say this is my family's secret recipe. There's a very, you know, strong line between like appreciation and appropriation, which I think we're very careful Mm -hmm. about. But the idea is to really bridge, if you're curious about Southeast Asian flavor, but you're not quite ready to like make a whole meal and dig into hacking a lemongrass stock, or you're not quite sure which of the, you know, curries to sort of go into in that aisle, we have something that just bridges you there. What are some of your most popular SKUs? I mean, the chimichurri is definitely a winner. I think that people kind of know what to do with it. Yeah. You know, romesco is a little esoteric, I think, for consumers. Tahini's growing on people. Ginger miso is the number Mm. two because I think people just think, like, I know that this goes on salmon. How do you make it different then? I mean, this is a very crowded category. Uh There's a lot of great sauces out there. They've gotten better and better. Mm -hmm. Some are refrigerated. Some are shelf-stable. Yeah. You know, some have, like, a high price point. Some are—I mean, they're very— Yeah. They're they're multitudes. How do you do it? Yeah. I mean, in— in 2017, when we first met with Whole Foods, there were no other refrigerated sauces. It just wasn't, you know, everything was in a glass jar or, you know, a hard plastic, you know, squeeze bottle in the condiment set. We were sort of the first. Um, there are still very few sauces and pouches. Again, there's innovation there. Um, and, you know, we we have worked really hard to sort of, you know, stay true to really clean label, you know, as as close to what someone would consider authentic as possible, although that's defined differently by everyone. Um, and I think what really has distinguished us is we have incredible trust from our consumer and we have always been super consumer focused. Yeah. So there are a lot of sauces that come out, a lot of condiments out there, more so in the last couple of years for sure since COVID. And they're all sort of you know, if you if you buy this, then you become part of our cool kid club. Mm-hmm. We've never been a cool kid club. I'm mm. not a cool kid. <laughs> so we've always been like, we don't actually, this isn't about us. This is about you in your kitchen yeah. trying to get dinner on the table in 15 minutes. So our mindset is just different. I mean, if the chimichurri is super good, you're going to oh, yeah. like get return customers. Yeah, oh, no. I mean, we have incredible repeat and, you know, our velocities are super strong, which, you know, is a fun CPG. I term. love that term. We'll get into CPG yeah. jargon and world. I mean, do you have, uh, are you seated in like Hungry Root Boxes or any of those? Like, how, like, how do you market your, uh, your sauces? We've been, I mean, pretty much brick and mortar retail since day one. Um, we, it's a refrigerated product. It's hard. It's hard to ship. It's yeah. hard to receive. Um, so we've really been focused on building out, you know, I'm, I think I have just a brick and mortar brain. Yeah. So when the world was kind of like, get as much distribution as possible and just like, you'll pay for it eventually. And somehow it's all going to be fine. My brain was like, mm. I can't afford to buy toilet paper this month, so I'm just going to hold off, you know. So, you know, we've never overextended. Whole Foods is a great business for us. Sprouts is a great business for us. We're in a couple of conventional accounts. The fresh market's great for us. Right. Um, But it's definitely, you know, there is more distribution coming. um, But I think with a fresh product that doesn't have an exact category in the store because it's not in condiments, right? It's in this like fresh netherworld a little bit. 
when you refrigerate a product, mm -hmm. it just like it, it it sells faster. It's like right there in this immediate section of the grocery store. Like Alipop knows this. That's what yes. their model is based on. Yeah, I mean that's you know ninety five percent of the RTD beverages right in in that set are do not need to be refrigerated. They're just there because they're cold and they're ready and they know that they move fast. Yeah, sauces are a little different. Um, I do think we have a nice high velocity, yeah. you know, like we do, that's the units per week. Um, and you do command a little bit of a premium being fresh because the consumer does value that. Um, it's just, it, you know, it's kind of like in some stores we're in the fermented foods next to the sauerkraut and the kimchi. In other stores we're next to the salad dressing. In other stores we're in meat. Yeah. So it becomes a little hard to ask a consumer to go hunt for us in their grocery store shop. Where do you want to be? What's like, are you, are you like, do you want to be like cozying up with meat or do you like feel like kimchi and, and slaw is like your guy? Well, I, we're not fermented and, yeah. um, kimchi and slaw is not necessarily where the bulk of people are running when yeah. they go to the grocery yeah, not, store. Yeah, not a traditional grocery store. Health yeah. Food. So oh, it works in a, it works in a, in a health food store. Um, I, it's a, that's a really good question. I mean, I, in 2019, if you asked every grocery, you know, store in America, they were like, we're building out more fresh. We know we need refrigerated condiments. The consumer wants the perimeter of the store. They want better for you. Then they got hit with a pandemic where they were basically like, all we need to focus on is hand sanitizer and toilet paper. Uh -huh. And so whatever strategic plan that was, and now they have a major labor crisis and an inflation crisis. So... That's not happening. So now I have to figure out, I want to be in the same place so that a consumer always knows where I am and is like, oh, that makes sense. Figuring that out is a little challenging. Yeah. We'll get into a little bit of the figuring out part mm -hmm. uh, later in this conversation. Cool. But I want to talk about CPG content. Mm -hmm. You host a podcast in the sauce. It's great. I do. And I'm going to link to it in the show notes. So you, you actually follow the world. And, you know, CPG, a grocery store, uh, is like a micro theme here. We we have founders yeah. on often, but we, it's not what we do. But I, I wanted to have you in because you have this great sense in your podcast and in your writing um, about this world. And it seems to me, and this is an observation, mm -hmm. is that CBG content is having a bit of a boom. Like okay. Erwan was just on the cover of fucking New York yeah. magazine. Nate Rosen, Andrea Hernandez run these cool CBG newsletters that have crossover into, into the mainstream media. People love these guys. And then, of course, there's Emily Sundberg's Feed Me, which is like a must read in general yeah. uh, across retail, across media. I just media. like her photos. Dude, the, the selfies? Posts, the selfies are so funny. She's oh, great. Great. She's a must read, but I bring her up because she focuses on food and, and CBG quite yeah. a bit. And, and like five years ago, one of the like most followed media uh, newsletters would not be covering the grocery store. Right. So let me ask you, is this the most interesting part of food media right now? I think that's a good question. I'm sort of seeing like in my head as you're talking, I'm seeing like a bicycle wheel and the center of the bicycle wheel and then all these like spokes coming out of it. So I'll unpack my brain a little bit. Number one, I think we cannot emphasize enough what happened to what we all thought of and you and I kind of like grew up in in like what food content was. Mm -hmm. It was recipes. It was Martha. It was Bon App, And it's like everyone in their chambray shirt age, right? Like, do you remember that? <laughs> oh, totally. There was like, what are we all wearing? Um, oh my God, Andrew Knowlton. <laughs> no, I mean, I remember, yeah. I re and I remember being like, what am I missing? Yeah. But that's all gone, right? Mostly because there is so much food content. There's, there's so many different channels. There's so many different places. It's totally democratized. That's free. So what's interesting I mean, I also just at some point, like how many more roast chicken recipes can there be and why do we all need 27 pages of SEO to get to that recipe? Yeah. And then have a really bad ad load experience. Yeah. And, and breaks, by breaks the way, phone. maybe it worked. The only person <laughs> I ever, I, Ina's recipes always worked. Yeah. And that was something for me when we were making our recipes, they have to work. But so I think that, I think secondly, you know, the sort of behind the scenes founder journeys have sort of replaced the behind-the-scenes chef's journeys. You've talked about that on your show, the sort of power chef days. 
I think the combination of, you know, the Me Too stuff and just sort of the... Um, the fatigue and exhaustion? I think I, I think fatigue, I think the, the labor practices, I, I think there's just been... People don't want to worship those people anymore. So unfortunately, people need someone to to kind of worship. Um, I think that's just how media works maybe a little bit. And so you have these founder stories and the founders have sort of taken on that role. And so you have people talking about this business as if it's a TV show. Um, I, I'm sure there's going to be more Shark Tanky type of mm -hmm. things. I'm sure they're going to be following businesses type of things. And and so I, I think it's interesting. And it's something that, you know, you can go buy for four dollars instead of going to spend your, you know, rent on to have a, a meal and then hopefully maybe get to take a picture of it. So well, I think all those things happen. Well said, Ali. I mean, I think you Thanks. hit so many points and you really thought that through. And I um, agree mostly on the chef thing, though. I think I would just like reframe it and say, for me, it's like we are not picking the chefs we want to pick versus it being like they're all kind of not good. I'm not you're not saying that. I know. But like, yeah. I think we we've like been able to siphon out the ones and like the people who are irrelevant. There's real relevance for the chef community, but also the small luxuries in life yeah. is picking up a really cool spice or picking yeah. up a sauce or picking up a product. And, you know, it doesn't cost a lot. The berry entry is very low, but it excites us. It's like makes our, our evening at yeah. home a little more better. Totally. It's, it's I mean, Andrea said it on your podcast about Walmart being the new Kith. I wrote you and I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. Like, what a great line. You know, when you have kids going to Walmart and taking a picture with a coffee or a Pop-Tart and that's their big TikTok post, you know, that's cool. Yeah. That's great. You know, I mean, it's it there. There's a lot that I think oversimplifies it. You know, I there's a lot more pain in this business than, yeah. than people talk about, which I'm fairly open about, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I think it's I think it's content that people enjoy and it's also very accessible to them. I love it. You talk about like the storytelling around founders uh, coupled with the product discovery. Mm -hmm. I want to shift gears and talk about the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And like I've talked about this with several on the show and I wanted to get your take. You you work in uh, CPG and you you work with distributors and big chains. Mm -hmm. um, why is the current grocery store model so fucked up? Like oh, it seems like you talk to everyone and it's just there's so much waste and the barrier to entry is so fucking high. Yeah. And I I wonder from a founder's point of view, like if you agree, and secondly, how do we fix it? Yeah. So how we fix it, I don't know. I remember in like 2018, 2019, one of the reasons why I was happy about diversifying out of brick and mortar into a product was because I kind of knew that, you know, our rent was good. Labor was manageable. People were willing to pay. You know, the weather had been nice. Like there was just everything needed to be okay because the margins on that business are so slim. The margins on a grocery store business are even slimmer. Mm. So if one of those bows or whatever bows breaks, right, I mean, the trucks need to be able to get there. We had major supply chain and logistics issues. We don't have people who want to drive trucks anymore. We don't have people who want to stock shelves anymore. And, you know, what, What again, going back to the money, there was so much venture money. And so, you know, the way that these grocery stores make their money isn't by selling the condiment or the spice or the pop tart the way they do it is through ad spend and marketing dollars from the brands yeah retail the, advertising right. is a billion dollar business and retail advertising is not talked about that much no and the way that the brands get that money it's not from selling the pop tart right it's from venture mm -hmm. and if that dries up we're going to have less to spend they're going to have less to spend and so a reset, if you think about how hard it is for a grocery store to meet all of the different condiment people, we're all clamoring. We're all like, we have the best condiment. <laughs> we have the best condiment, right? They're like, thank you. They have a thousand of us on their desk. Then they need to make their selections, do the thing, revamp all of the planograms. And then within a week at, at every store, they need all of those shelves cleared and all of those shelves reset. 
why would they do that frequently? Yeah. It's it's a massive undertaking. So it's always been a precarious system because the margins have never really made a ton of sense in their natural mm. state. And now we're seeing between like global supply chain issues, labor issues, an economy where people are not comfortable spending there's a lot of pressure on and a planet system. that's being cooked by waste. And totally. Talk about some of the most wasteful businesses are groceries. Yeah. I mean, and you have a consumer, and I used to talk about this a lot with food. You know, when we had the brick and mortar, you have a consumer who has been trained to think, A, that food should be cheap, and B, that human labor is free. And... Mm. It, you know, making something of quality with integrity and doing it in a fair and decent way is too expensive, really, for what the consumer is willing to spend for it. Can you take a crack at how a grocery store should look in 20 years? Take like a crack. Like this is not a perfect no. exercise. So I'm not going to give you a satisfying answer because I have a very strong feeling about a grocery store can look like Walmart. A grocery store can look like Costco. A grocery store can look like Happier or Irwan. But it has to look like what it looks like. It has to be what it is, and it has to have brand integrity. Mm -hmm. So Irwan works because Irwan is a marketing channel, and they know that, and they stick to it, and they're great at it, and it works, and it should look like that. Costco works because they have a tiny selection I think they have like 3,500 SKUs or something. Are you like, kidding me? At a, at a, tiny. Wow. I mean. Amazing. It, if, have, you, if you have you listened to the Acquired podcast? Uh, yeah, definitely. Is that okay. a good, good a Costco's good? Whoa. The Costco one, the Walmart one, yeah. they're both amazing. Yeah, but the Costco guys are one, I'm like, this is the best company in the world. They have like an average of a 17-year like employee retention average. Like it's insane. Well done, Costco. Mm -hmm. And we're not in Costco, so. They also make like the best uh, pumpkin cheesecake. I mean, their like, Kirkland thing is a whole thing. Yo, on itself, pumpkin right? cheesecake, like that is the guy. They're there. they're they're so so nothing nothing should look like Costco if it's not Costco. But what you're seeing is like with any organization, right? A school, a a business, yourself as a human. When you start acting like something that you're not, or you're trying to be something different from what your core is. People can feel it and sense it, and it comes out in your pores, right? And so that's what's happening. Some of these grocery stores are like, we're super into innovation. Like, yay, we love young emerging brands. I'm like, we want to do all these DEI things. And then you're like, but you don't. So just don't. Be who you are. Walmart is who they are. It's that's a why it satisfying works. answer, Allie. Thank you. I think you're uh, because you're. I'm asking the impossible. Like, it, it can't look like a specific thing because we we live our world in multitudes and we don't always need an Erewhon in our life. We no. And for the times you do, it's great to have them. Have you ever walked into a restaurant and been like, I can see the Pinterest board. I can see the de like the decorator being like, you should definitely use this green because they saw it, whatever. But you can feel that it doesn't have like a, a heart and a soul yeah. underneath. That's the same thing with grocery stores. When we, they are what they are, it doesn't matter if it's like super value or like super high end. You feel it in your body. You know? Do you remember when like Just Salad hit New York for yeah. the first time and then all the other ones came yep. in like the early 2000s? That is what you're describing. I, I mean, there was a there was a I shall not name it. There was another <laughs> cooking school that literally ripped off our logo, our design, our classes they came to like 40 classes that year and it was a little fishy, but then they opened this thing and wow, it enraged me. And someone said to me, it was Liz Newmark, and she said, they could open a heaven's kitchen across the street from you. It could look literally exactly the same. People might go once. They're not going twice yeah, because there's something in the air. And that's just like, that's just... It's the same thing with a product. You taste something, you're going to try it once maybe if it looks cool and the packaging's cool and like some content creator made it and tells you to go get it. But if it's not like satisfying, it's sort of like, I don't know, spiritually for lack of a better word, you're not going to go back. It's so interesting. We're talking about copycat culture and we can even drill down to it deeper because, you know, with a physical space, you know, there's a lot going on. You can definitely sniff it out. But when we're talking about like a probiotic soda, 
there's like you know four of them and i you know i have my favorite and you may have your favorite i but can't f- drink any of them if you can't drink any of them that's... i can't drink anything fizzy oh is that just like bad for your teeth no i just it makes me like yeah. pick up and makes you feel not great I, yeah um I'm sorry. That's okay. That uh, was a second. You're missing way. no, but you 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 missed out on crystal Pepsi. I like gin and tonic. You missed tonics. out on crystal Pepsi. Yeah. I like gin and tonics. Oh yeah. Does you, that count? I think a gin and tonic you like, you know, can choke it down yeah. once in a while. I'll make it work. <laughs> but like, you know, we don't know which probiotic soda to to pick. Right. And like if you're copying in CPG, it's like a little different, I feel, than like a physical space. Yeah. I mean, first of all, what a waste of money. I mean, it's just so sad. And I always, you know, it's not nice. But again, I picture people being like, there's this huge market and there's this white space and these guys are doing great. So let's just like do this also. And again, there's no there's no heart behind it. It's not cynical either. It's like facts. I I mean, I think so. I think the other thing is I had I had someone on my podcast because I I went into a bookstore like two weeks ago. And the front table was all these memoirs, and they all looked exactly the same. They all had, like, a black and white thing and, like, someone looking kind of serious and then, like, a font. And those people, the the people who designed the jackets did not copy each other. They they were all probably riffing off of something, yeah. and it just kind of came out. There are sort of these, like, zeitgeists that happen mm-hmm. and, you know— Puffy Burger King font is really in, but then like minimal sort of like hard to now it's going to be like gaming font and whatnot. Oh my gosh, gaming font is so real. I mean, you can and the media kind of leads the conversation. I feel totally. You look like the art directors at New York Magazine lead the lead the conversation, and you yeah. look at you know like Substacks, like people doing like their own fonts as the headers of yeah. Substacks. I mean, George Harrison had that whole court case back in like you know because he accidentally you know, copied a song and he got like, he, yeah. he like plagiarized. And I don't, I, he was like, I wasn't alive. Yeah. I mean, I might've been little, but I've read, he's like, oh my God, I had no yeah. idea. I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, yeah. You, these things enter your, your brain waves a little bit. They're all over. You're just inundated with these images and you start to think you're having an original thought and it's not original. The problem is, is that people don't, these teams are getting they're they're running too fast and they're they're trying to get stuff done in a way where they're they're not being intellectually honest with themselves and looking back mm-hmm. and being like wait this might actually look a lot like someone else's stuff yeah. you know but like it's the guys the the hypothetical guys in the in the boardroom mm-hmm. and like talking about white space and talking yeah. about brand white guidelines space. and how can we yeah. how can we like leverage you know a, a love of of a pink millennial pink remember that whole thing oh i remember yeah. i think i actually started canary yellow oh i just want to yeah. say that publicly yeah we're on the record so yeah. canary yellow talk about <laughs> was this a was this a haven's kitchen <laughs> no it package? was in my house and it was 2012 and i just want to say okay Canary yellow might be me. It was your house. Um, what what room was it? It was the living room. I have oh. these two and and I and I the couches are because there was a like a canary yellow Nike that I was like obsessed with from this like Japanese Nike book from the 80s. And I was like, I want couches that look just like those sneakers. And so I put these two like canary yellow again, a segue. Yeah. N- not a no, part. it's a good segue. But um they were they're in my living room and then, you know, things started becoming canary yellow. I just, I'm going to give myself credit for that. Let me ask you about your show in the sauce. Mm-hmm. And you, you talk to a lot of founders. And yeah. I mean, money is tight yeah. right now. They're psyched. They're psyched. Yeah, <laughs> just right. kidding. No, just kidding. I mean, the Grim Reaper is like around the corner on a lot yeah. of these companies. And 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 it's not going to get great in 24. Yeah. And, you know, we're definitely like, we're, we're firmly post-pandemic. So there's no like weird worlds coming to an end uh, narrative well, that they can hide behind. Yeah. I mean, we're post pandemic. I think the this... world might be coming to an end, but not because of the not pandemic. because of the pandemic. Yeah. But like yeah. that was like a little bit of a narrative. Yes. that people could like use when thinking about scaling back or whatever. Right. But that's like not as much of an excuse. Yeah. So let me ask you, Ali, when talking to all the founders on your weekly show, what's the tone out there? Because it seems pretty dark. I think the tone went from "oh shit" to "okay, grr." I'm going to figure this shit out, right? Like, I think it went to some people are still hoping for a Hail Mary from an investor who's going to give them a predatory deal. Mm. I don't know what to say about that. 
not not a great plan. Some people are still hoping for a Hail Mary that somehow distribution, their new PO from wherever is going to solve the problem. Again, probably wishful thinking. There are a lot of founders right now who are like, actually, if I get down to brass tacks, I get rid of some of the retailers. We said goodbye, thank you, to a retailer that looked very cool that was actually not a good margin for us, for example. Streamline my accounts, streamline my team, streamline my SKU assortment. I actually have a shot. And if I have a shot and I'm still here in two or three years, even if it's small, even if I'm not growing top line that much, but I'm like, you know. Cost but, under control. Yep. Less employees. Exactly. Maybe less, less shipping costs. Maybe get close to profitability, right? Then I have a real business with a real chance when the cycle comes back around because the cycle always comes back around. Yeah. But it's like the endurance game. Definitely marathon. A, it's endurance, and B, it's, you know, easy for me to say because I do have investors that are supportive of me, and I fortunately have, I'm not, you know, a, feeding my family on this company, and, you know, there's a lot of privilege there, right, that that certain founders have that others don't. Um, but I, I think the tone is a little bit more, like, fighting than yeah. it is sad. No, I love that. that. That's that's perfect. I'd love to hear that because yeah. I didn't want to hear the, like, everything world's coming to end because that's, like, frankly, We're less founders. interesting. We're founders. We're, like, yeah. unnaturally and probably mm-hmm. problematically optimistic. Do you have institutional money? Is it friends and family? Where's your, who are your investors? I have um, two funds yeah. that one wasn't a fund when they invested but have since grown into a fund and then I have a ton of founders and operators and people that I know from the industry that are willing to be there. That's great. I mean, how do you communicate your 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 business with your with your, you know, with your partners and your investors? I mean, is it yeah. is it pretty rigorous? Is it um I mean, because I feel like that transparency is important, but it can be challenging to p- report. Well, you want to be careful that, you know, whatever you write is forwardable, right? So I'm not putting in specific numbers necessarily. And I'm also not sharing everything with everyone. There are investors that know every dirty, sad thing. And then there are investors that are, I'm like, well, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I set out this year very clear saying, you know, the goal this year is not to grow top line. It's going to be very hard for me writing you all because I send a quarterly investor letter to everyone on my cap table. Um, I, My goal is not to be like, and this one and that one and this number and that. My goal this year is to get my my margins in order and like get closer to profitability, which mm-hmm. will mean that my top line will suffer a little bit. Um, hopefully we won't be lower than we were last year, but that's very much my plan. But flat, flat revenue can mean, um, better, uh, with the better adjustments, net. better net. Yeah, exactly. And ours is like 12 points. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I want to check back with you in a year or two years. Next year is going to be a big accelerator. Year. I love it. It's, it's great. And, and. You know, it's it's just cool to talk to you because we our our world's gonna overlap in a couple of ways. It's it's not just founder C, CPG talk, but but food media and um and just like being in New York and yeah. in the scene. And it's so cool to talk to you. I feel less in the scene than when I had a brick and mortar. I felt kind of like I knew someone at some place all the time. Now I feel like old. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, feeling old, but. I don't feel old and cool as much. I feel just kind of thick. When I had the brick and mortar, I didn't necessarily know all the people that ran the restaurants. But because we had such a rigorous event business, every server in New York at some point, and it was a good gig and we paid well and we had a lot going on. Mm -hmm. So I knew all the bartenders. I knew all the servers. I knew, you know, I knew a bunch of the like the workhorses. Um and then, you know, I'd show up at a place and it'd be fun. Now, yeah, I don't have that as much. But What's the wildest event you had at Haven's Kitchen, the brick and mortar? Just give me like the we wild, had, wild boy night. Oh, my gosh. we. So one of the fun things about us was that because we had all of these restaurant friendships, when they wanted to have their holiday parties or the chef's birthday party or – and they didn't want to have it at their restaurant because they didn't want to deal, they had it at our place. So we had a bunch of those over the years. I had to leave 
one night because people were literally like sliding down the banisters and <laughs> and they were was, great stairs. I love those. They were they w- gave me like yeah. a lot of agita. Yeah. Um so we had some great parties. And then we had I mean from a just I mean Malala mm. came yeah for something. We had um Instacart's first event, Siggy's first event. We had, we hosted, remember Juicero? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was just a total disaster. Oh, my We gosh. had his launch party. And it was funny because that was, all of that was informing us along the way, thinking like, a lot of these things, like, we could make a product. Yeah, like, Juicero was like literally just a package. Yeah, of you know, I mean, and it, and then and the, the Times reporter went to the farmer's market and like they did this whole thing. And Ugh. we had all the great book parties. Yeah. I mean, it was great. It was I great. mean, I feel like you could write a great something with all these nights. Well, you know what we did? We had a closing report every night and whoever was the closing manager wrote out a little paragraph on Amazing. what happened that day. And you can imagine the stories. I mean, some of them are just, just nuts and funny. Um, and we got very creative with it. So uh, everyone there was sort of like, I think, not necessarily a writer in their own mind, but most people sort of wrote. Very, it was like an entertaining opportunity. It was entertainment. Right? For yeah. the closing night manager exactly. to, to, to write something funny. They had a good time doing it. So, I mean, that would be a good book. Yeah, as I'm saying. Yeah. Juicero, they, I'm sure they paid well. They paid. I thought you were going to say Juicero, the, oh, the book. Juicero <laughs> and 1,000 Other the Nights. The story behind the story. <laughs> they paid well, right? Everyone paid well. It was yeah. like the go-go. <clears throat> I mean, we had, yeah. And it's we were funny. Like, yeah. The go-go years, because they were, because like money was cheap. Flowing. And like events in food were so prominent because there was no social media right. to throw money into. So you had to do offline events. And- yeah. And then, I mean, I remember when, okay, so it started, you know, in 2012 with events for editors and events for, you know, for writers. And then it started being influencer events. And then it started being experiential, mm-hmm. you know, and then it, it, I think I think events are coming back. They are. Which is really fun for me because I'm such an IRL person. Yeah. Um, and and that's why we actually, when we closed the school, we did get a physical space and we do have events there, not for other people. Oh, you really. have a physical space, like, oh, like your office? Yeah. I had no idea. We're doing an event tomorrow night for taste and we're doing an event in December for taste. Well, we don't really rent it. Yeah. I, I would we would, you know, but so it's not like a back. It's like, but we have events there and we do partnerships and events with other people. So we did like a really cool, like East Fork Pottery and us. And then the other night, Will Coleman did like a Friendsgiving there. And, you know, it's. it's Where is it at? What's the location? It's on the corner of Houston and Worcester. Oh, so right on. it's super fun. Houston and Worcester. Mm-hmm. Is that where Cafe Colonial was? No, that was. No, Elizabeth. we're like. um yeah, it's yeah, further down in Soho, Worcester and Houston. You know where Sedell's is? Yeah, it's, it's so by Sedell's. you Siddell's. go to Houston, you walk east a block, and then you walk down a little. You, Allie, you know real estate. You've got a great sense. Well, I grew up here. Yeah, so that's it? Is it being, being a New Yorker? Well, you know, I have, as you know, I have a terrible sense of direction. <laughs> um, I know so because... I need to be on a grid, and I, I, I need to memorize where I'm at. Otherwise, I get lost. I know because of the bathroom you were you were, Yes. You were it took lost me about 45 minutes to get back from the bathroom, it's which a, is a, about a, like 14 second walk. Where do you want to be in 10 years? What do you want to be doing? Yeah. So part of me wants to work at Costco. Yes. Um, yeah. Like like, like in. Um, I don't know. Check out. My, I, have a, I have a good family friend who works um, at, a, at a location and, and she has great things to say. about. Honestly, working. there's like a part of me that really wants to like live that out. Another part of me wants to work at a strategic that buys us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Putting that out there. I love that term strategic. It's such a great. It just says so much. Yeah. Like otherwise, Coca-Cola. Big, big CPG. Big food, CPG. Publicly Coca-Cola, company. Nabisco, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I, I've been told that would not be as much fun as I think it is. I think I love this industry. I love, I posted something today because I was in a bad mood and we got a no from a retailer. Mm. And I just was like, you know, I'm I'm careful, but I'm not, you know, I'm vulnerable, I think, on LinkedIn. And I just get so much good feedback from people who like need to hear it. Yeah. So there's a part of me I don't know that I can monetize that because I think that would sully it 
but I think in 10 years, hopefully I don't need to, and I can just be a support system for people that are that are doing this for for the ones that I choose to work with. That's really neat. I feel like yeah, you're you're great. Like uh, a fairy godmother. Facilitator, you're great on LinkedIn. That's where I, we connected originally. And you you have a really smart way of of articulating your thoughts, which I think are are strong. Uh, you have strong opinions, which I like. Thanks, Matt. On this is taste we ask guests about their discerning taste. So to close this interview, here's a little rapid fire fast and furious taste check. Ali, are you ready? Yes. The best breakfast food Fried eggs over medium on buttered, very crispy rye toast. Where in New York would you eat that? At home. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, there's no. Yeah. Eh. There's no. I, I guess you're, I'm going old school New York. I want to like. I know. It's, it's a home thing. Me okay, too. Fine, fair enough. The best dessert. I would say really good strawberries and homemade whipped cream. Truth. Your favorite New York City restaurant. Right now, so the new Isodi, I just have to say, they're just like nailing it. It's it's so good. Did they move locations or they just did. rebooted it? No, they, they moved. Okay. Um, it's great. Yeah. They just, it's no fail. I'm not as into Via. Everyone yeah. loves Via. I really I like I was just Isodi. talking to an author today about Via and, and should I go? I was like, no, don't go. Go, go to Isodi. Isodi. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The people in the know now. Yeah. <laughs> um, Nordvik, I can't, I can't pronounce it. Yeah. It's great. It's local. It's mm. it's like the EMP chef. They just got two stars. Fortunately, yeah. like for them, they finally got written up. Great roast chicken. Great wine. Really good. Cool. Favorite classic New York City restaurant? Um, I mean, Katz's. I, I, I any Jewish deli I can support right now, I'm going to support. Your favorite grocery store national chain? <laughs> I'm asking you. Come on. Um. Oh my God. And not the bastards who passed. Gosh. Um, I mean, I, I, I do have love for Whole Foods. Call me no. you know, a yuppie. No, call you uh, uh, a grateful founder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that would have been my choice. They, they were the first ones to sign up. So Yeah, fucking, they go. were. Your favorite grocery store, we'll call it quirky or local. Um, I have a really cool Japanese grocer, like on 6th Avenue and 12th Street that I just like wandering around and like playing and I I mean I get the same three things every time I'm there but mm-hmm. they always have fun things I don't know what do you buy there what's the last thing uh, the the pickled daikon oh yeah you know it, like the red one the neon ones yeah I don't know why it's red yeah um and it's chopped and it's in like a little baggie and oh, yeah. it just goes with everything it really does okay your favorite cookbook of all time silver palette part one Part one. Part eh. Way to, way to yeah. be specific. Well, because they have the silver palette Re- good times. Revision. Oh, they have a good times? I don't <laughs> yeah, know and I'm one. just, I'm not as into good times. You're not into it. No. Your favorite recent cookbook discovery? Jinx. Oh, yeah. I love her. And it's, I'm reading it like it's a book. The Book of Szechuan Chili Crisp. Yeah. Great book. Uh, Jing's been on the show a few times. Yeah. She's a good friend. Super cool. Jingao, yeah. And and now in the the restaurant I know. Business. I love it. I love it. Out just, in Larchmont? In L.A.? Yeah. It's cool. Like, I, I, I really wish her the best in that. I think it's going to be a cool thing if she can make that happen. It's totally it's agree. So nutty. I know. I'm getting the bug again, which I'm like, no. Oh, about doing physical spaces? Yeah. But we'll talk about that in another. Another show. We'll, we'll have you back. Um, your favorite vegetable? Um, I would say Brussels sprouts. Fair. I really like them. Fair. And I feel like they're so versatile. Absolutely agree. Thank you. Even steamed, they're fine. You know, I read about this I, okay. because I was like, why, why, what happened when I was growing up that Brussels sprouts were so gross and now they're so good? Allie. They hey. changed. You know this, right? Oh, no. They now grow a different variety. Oh, that's interesting. Th- th- it's like not in my imagination that, I mean, my mother is the first to admit. They were like way more bitter. They were bitter yeah. and they were bigger and they were just like n- watery. They actually changed. It's like the banana. They changed the yeah. the you know whatever strain genus. Um, I was gonna say like there was actually canned Brussels sprouts back That's in the day. That's just which is like <laughs> really not anus. acceptable. I'm sorry that yeah. if you pulled over your car and, and just puked. Yeah. But hearing that, um, last one favorite sandwich. Uh, I mean, clean turkey at Court Street. Mm. Have you ever climbed Bear Mountain <laughs> and had a clean turkey from Court Street? A sandwich to go from Court Street for any upstate endeavors or, yeah, it's absolutely. This, the the bread was still crispy. The the what they do this whole combo. It's great. Of, I mean, it's just great. I love it. 
Allie Kane, you're going to come back, I hope. I mean, if you'll have me, I'd I will love to absolutely come back. have you back. Thank you so much for joining This Is Taste. Thanks, Matt. This Is Taste is hosted by Eliza Abarbanel and me, Matt Rodbar. The show is produced by Shalia Harris and Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumber. Theme music by Steve Rydell. Visit Taste Online at tastecooking.com and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter for updates on all cool things that are happening. 